All right, so today I am downtown Toronto in the heart of the city here. Uh, I have a walk-in cooler that's down. It's running warm. So let's do some troubleshooting and see what's going on. All right, so let's go check our box here. So uh, we got to walk into the first box. It's connected to the second walk-in cooler box. Got a P1 error code there, which that's all right. That's just our display. Uh, low superheat, so we definitely got some issues there. Same thing on this coil, so both key to therm controllers are flashing error codes. And it's warm in the box here. So up on our gauge here, we are showing approximately 60 degrees. All right, so let's get up to our condensing unit. It's a little bit of a hike. Uh, let's go check and see what's going on with this compressor. And let's do some troubleshooting from here. All right, finally getting up the ladder here. And we have four systems here. We're working on the bottom system here. Uh, breaker was tripped. <laughs> so let's go all the way back down. 10.4 amps. That's nice that someone marked that. All right, we got it reset. And I've disconnected our compressor. Okay, I just want to confirm the incoming power is good. So we're getting 201 here, 2012, 202 on our second combination, and our final combination, we are getting 201 volts. So we are all good there. So let's fire up the unit, and we're pulling 64 amps. Wow. Okay, so that's why we're tripping a 20 amp breaker. So let's go investigate and see what's going on here. All right, so I have to test it really quick or else I'm gonna trip the breaker downstairs. So we gotta work smart. So we're getting 194 volts there. Let's go to our next combination. Getting 194 volts. All right, and let's check our last combination, make sure we're not dropping a phase. And bang, we're getting 194 volts. And so our voltage is dropping because our amperage is so high. There's 65 amps. So you can see we have a call for cooling. Okay, so what I'm finding really strange is my pressures are 145 and 308. Okay, that's with the compressor off. Okay, we should be equalized right now or attempting to equalize. So our pressures are insanely, insanely high. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and recover a little bit of refrigerant. And let's run it again and see what happens. So we're at about 128 PSI. Uh, we've removed a lot of refrigerant. About four pounds there. All right, so as you can see here, um, pressures are insanely high. Like my compressor is not even running. So let's just go figure out what our pressure should be and let's just start working backwards and let's just try to figure out everything that's going on. So first thing we wanna do is figure out our suction pressure. So we're just gonna use a ballpark figure. So we're just gonna simply go our current box temp, um, minus our 10 Fahrenheit EVAP coil. So let's say our box temp was 60 Fahrenheit. I think that's what it was. And we subtract 10 Fahrenheit. That gives us 50 Fahrenheit. So 50 Fahrenheit, Okay, so that's giving us 105, which will never, it'll, the TXV won't let it throttle that high, but just for argument's sake, so 105 PSI, and then our head pressure, we actually have a water-cooled condenser. So our water-cooled condenser, generally we're looking for either a 80 Fahrenheit or 90 Fahrenheit uh, condenser saturation temperature. Okay, so based on 80 to 90 saturation, we can just come in this block right here, and that gives us 173 to 202 is what we're looking for. 173 to 202. All right, so let's just slide over to our refrigeration cycle chart uh, and put in our refrigeration pressures. So our actual system was getting 145 PSI and on our suction and then our head was 308 
PSI. Okay, and we are looking for 105 PSI. And then for our head pressure, let's go with the highest value. So let's go to our 90 condenser saturation. So that would put us at 202 PSI, okay? So this is what the system equalized, okay? Look how high our pressures are. So what's supposed to happen is when we start up this compressor, okay, our suction pressure is gonna go down, okay, which is fine, but our head pressure is gonna go up if our compressor is running. It's not in this case, okay? So our pressures are insanely, insanely high here, okay? So let's go recover a little bit of refrigerant, uh, fire up, and then see what's going on. All right, so let's go ahead and fire up here. We've recovered. And we are still getting 69 amps. All right, pressures are not moving. All right, so we recovered there. Uh, we had the pressures down to like 128, 130. Uh, still drawing 69 amps. So the thing I'm not super understanding is why was our head pressure so high? Okay, this system had the solenoid open and it was off for like a couple hours. Uh, this thing should equalize. This head pressure should have never been this high. It shouldn't go above 200 PSI with this water-cooled condenser. So uh, it's possible we had that bad of a burnout and, um, you know, bad acid in the refrigerant, whatever, in the system. But um, I'm super interested to find out why this happened. So uh, hopefully... If my buddy Dave G is listening, you know, he can pipe in in the comments or, you know, any of the other uh, refrigeration superstars. Yeah, if you can explain why my head pressure was at 308 with a system equalized for a couple hours, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, just put that in the comments or whatever. Send me a message on Facebook. All right, so I'm just going to quickly, very quickly go over how a, a, a water cool condenser works. I know for my technicians, you guys do not like working on these, but it's really simple. We're just substituting the condenser fan for water. So instead of moving air, we're, water, we're moving water through. Um, and it's super efficient actually to use a water-cooled condenser versus an air-cooled condenser. The obvious issue is uh, the cost of water um, is super expensive. So that's why these are not super popular anymore. But back in the day, these were extremely popular. So basically we have water coming through our water source. It hits a water pressure, reg pressure regulating valve. Okay, then it's going to send water into our condenser and then water is going to come out the drain. So based on the pressure in the system on the high side, which we're going to take from here. Okay, it's going to come through this capillary tube. It's going to tell this valve how much water to let through or how much to open or close. And it's trying to regulate 80 to 90 condenser saturation. Okay, so usually on our air cooled, we're looking for either 15 plus condenser saturation or 30 plus. In this case, we're looking for 80 to 90, okay? So, and the factors that give that is usually, um, you know, the, the water pressure that's coming through and then the temperature of the water. So that's why you get the variance between 80 and 90. I like to be around 85 to 90. Uh, if you tweak this valve correctly, you can get there. But 80 to 90 will suffice as long as your sight glass is clear. All right, so as you can see there, we've covered all the refrigerant. Uh, here's the compressor, which is going to be a pain to get out. But uh, let's go ahead and go grab a compressor. Alright, so I got the compressor. We're just going to hit fast forward here and uh, get a nice little sight of the uh, Gardner Expressway in downtown Toronto. Enjoy. Now I'm 
move on to the next challenge, getting the compressor up and into place. here we're all good let's go perform a nitrogen test and we'll do a leak test and then once all that is done uh, we'll pull her down to a good vacuum obviously because we're assuming we had a bad burnout and then we'll charge her up and go from there All right, no leaks. That's good news. All right, so our pressures are 26 and 185. We got about almost four and a half pounds in there. Sight glass is still flashing. So let's continue to charge it until we get this sight glass full. All right, sight glass is finally full. Pressures are up to 44 and 182. And you can see we're at temperature here, 35. We got one box is 35, or one coil, sorry, the other coil. We're at 37. We do have an error code being logged on that right controller. All right, so let's go check out our pressures one last time. So our current box temperature is 35 Fahrenheit. Let's subtract our 10 evap td which is should be close to our superheat and that's going to give us 25 fahrenheit and if we go check out 25 fahrenheit on our pt um we're getting 63 okay and our head pressure is not going to change so we want to be in this range so let's go back over to our refrigeration cycle chart and we are getting 43 here we're looking for 65 okay then we're getting 182 psi which is within our range um so i'm having problems with this evaporator coil so if you saw the one on the right hand side had an error code so what's going on there is they're not communicating so one's on one's off one's in defrost one's not in defrost I'm going to go figure out why they're not communicating and then we're going to go from there. All right, so the two systems are communicating now. I put a network cable between the two coils. Uh, the, this site does not use that remote monitoring. They didn't even know they had it. There was a modem, but they do not want that feature. You can see the air light is gone. We're all good. All right, so in that training video, uh, the focus was more on refrigeration pressures and cycle rather than schematics. Uh, so basically what was happening was those two evaporator coils are not communicating. So one would be at temperature and it would pump down. The second one would continue to call for cooling. What happens when that happens is the pressures drop and then the compressor runs under low load. Compressor does not like that. Um, is that potentially the reason why the compressor failed? It's really hard to say at this point. So I did speak to the customer and they said they've had that communication error thing for like two, three years. Okay, so we're, I'm new to coming to this site. So there's a good chance that thing's been going into pump down when it shouldn't be. And what was happening as well was the left coil would go into defrost and the, run, the right one would still be running. And then vice versa, 20 minutes later, it would go the other way. So the compressor was just being put through all kinds of things that it shouldn't be put through, you know, running while, another, while one of the coils are on defrost. So we had all kinds of factors factoring in here. Uh, these ketotherm systems are, can get pretty complicated. Uh, they are super interesting. Uh, we're starting to see more and more of these so i'm potentially going to make a training video just on troubleshooting those i didn't do it on this one because that would have been like a 40 minute video going through all the settings because i have to change all the defrost settings everything was just programmed incorrectly on this thing but in the end we got the unit fixed everything's good and we most likely found the root cause of the compressor failure